This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star today's show is the Sim Racing Cube OSW steering wheel. And I'll give you some model numbers and all the important details, but this is a direct drive wheel and it is a beast of a motor. And I have all sorts of things to tell you about this wheel. Now, the main thing, what is a direct drive wheel? I mean, the whole concept of direct drive wheels semi-new to sim racing still, but it is the biggest thing in sim racing and everybody wants one. It's the concept of taking a servo moto, a motor like this that's designed for conveyor belts or printing presses, heavy machinery, and figuring out a way to make this deliver the force feedback that we sim racers need. Now we're accustomed to plastic wheels, wheels with just moderate amounts of force feedback, giving us the sensations of being in a car. But the real goal of a direct drive wheel is to actually give you the real life forces that any car on the market could deliver you one to one, getting you that much closer to the realism and the expectation that we really have as sim racers. So let's talk about the Sim Racing Cube, the OSW wheel by them. Open source wheel is the whole concept of a company sourcing wheel various different parts, and then using software that is constantly being upgraded. Instead of it being the Logitech, the Thrustmaster, the Fanatic, or even the Sim Experience or Leo Bodner's of the wor world, this is more like open source any type of software where there are constant updates, a lot of different profiles from various users throughout the internet, and a whole lot of information but it doesn't come packaged quite as spick and span as the things from Logitech, Thrustmaster, and Fnatic. So let's talk about this wheel, what it costs, and what you're actually getting. Again, this is the Sim Racing Cube OSW kit BIS C with the CM110 case. It goes for about 1,302 euro or about $1,520 in the US. What do you get for your money? You get a midge motor, it's a 30 newton meter powered motor and it measures in at 10 by seven and a half by five. And I gotta tell you, this wheel, it actually weighs like a metric ton. I can't even lift it barely sitting here in front of you. It is the biggest, it is the heaviest wheel that I've ever tested. And at 30 newton meters, it's also the strongest wheel that I've ever put my hands on. You also get a power supply that comes in a Cooler Master case, a motor mount, which comes in three pieces, heavy duty motor cables that come in at eight feet long, two different six foot USB cables, and an emergency stop that is connected to the power cables that's actually a foot longer coming in at nine feet. And then finally you get the wheel mount or wheel adapter that'll work with just about any standard steering wheel out in the market. Now that doesn't give you any extras like shifters, button boxes, any of that kind of stuff. If you want to do that, you're going to have to come up with a secondary solution, which there are a lot of, but they usually come in at a pretty stiff price. Now for testing today, and I'm not reviewing this right now, I have the Sim Racing Machines Fanatic Adapter, or Converter if you want to call it. It's a conversion kit. It goes for 99 euro, and what it does is it has the quick release, and it goes right onto the wheel adapter, and it turns this into a Fanatic, or not turns it, it allows you to use any Fanatic rim. So that was an immediate solution. And I do happen to have a few Fanatic wheel rims around. So it gave me my shifters and my buttons, everything I wanted to really complete the package. So now that you've heard everything that you actually get for your money, let's talk about what it takes to install this. And there are a few things that you need to think about before you even purchase a wheel like this. The sheer weight alone is gonna be very demanding of any rig. If your rig is home built and it's not sturdy, this might collapse that wheel deck. If your rig is store-bought or one of the brands that you can purchase, it better be a very strong wheel deck. Just the, the size and the bulk and the weight is enough to make and test any rig to its fullest, let alone the force feedback it's gonna deliver. On top of that, this is not a standard mount. This mount is actually seven and a half inches wide and between two and five and a half inches front to back. Now on my R seat, that was bigger than my wheel deck. So I actually had to use some profile tubing as an adapter. Now there are a lot of different ways that you can accomplish this, but with the profile tubing, I was able to actually mount my button box as well. So I thought it worked pretty well. Now you have a three piece motor mount or the base mount we should call it. 
the front plate which holds the actual motor in place, and then the two side plates. The side plates are adjustable and you actually have a pretty good amount of range and angle on the wheel in addition to whatever your rig is. So you mount the base and then you adjust the angle. Again, it's going to take a very substantial rig to be able to do it. My R seat held up just fine, but it did push it to its absolute maximum. When installing the motor to the base, you can rotate and mount the wheel any direction you want for cable routing. Next is the output shaft to quick release mount or adapter. This uses a bolt to clamp the mechanism onto the shaft and then add any additional mounts or wheel right to that. It doesn't use a key, but you do have one available. From there in our case is that Fanatic adapter we talked about. This bolts right to the wheel mount and adds the quick release connection and the wiring for the Fanatic wheel rims. We will also need to install fana LEDs, which will give the wheel rim function as well, but we're not covering that today. Now, because of the massive amount of power that's going to be delivered, when I used my Fanatic quick release, I did use the little lockdown bolt. I'm not going to trust it just to the quick release, but that is a testament to the power of this motor, nothing else other than that. Now that we have the motor, motor completely installed onto our rig and ready to go it's time to get down to the wiring and we got a bit of wiring stuff to do now these connectors these are huge beefy connectors and it's one of the things that i love about this wheel it just when you're bolting these or screwing these onto the motor you know what kind of power you're going to get delivered now these are again eight foot shielded wire so that's good they're very heavy duty they're very expensive but it's going to change your wiring loom your wiring loom going from your computer to your wheel just got a whole lot more substantial connected to that we do have the emergency stop and as noted this emergency stop actually cuts the power so if you're in mid sim and you have a problem and i've had to you saw me on Wreckfest have to hit this button it just disables the power your wheel's still connected it's still working and then as soon as you release the quick release, you're back in action again with force feedback. So once we do that wiring, we also have the two six foot USB wires. Now we have USB on one end and mini on the other. The two mini go to the two on the case on the back and then the two USB. One of these is for data to the wheel and the other one is for doing firmware upgrades to the box. You want both of those plugged in simultaneously. That means six foot from computer to power supply and eight foot from power supply to steering wheel with an extra foot to go on the emergency cord. And on the hardware side of things, that is pretty much it. And that was actually pretty easy to do. I had a few mistakes where I did things out of order and had to go backward and forward, but all told, it didn't take that much effort and it all has to go together in one direction. Now on the software side of things, I have to say, things are a little more complex. You have two different pieces of software that you need to download and you do have some settings that you need to do and configuration that you need to make before this is going to be up and running. It's not really plug and play and again it does involve some reading and some configurating and it does take time. But it all starts with getting the SIM cube configurator. Once this is installed and running you can make adjustments to the wheel such as set up a profile, adjust your degrees of rotation, the power, any damper, friction, or inertia changes that you want, and we'll talk about that later. Then you will install the Granity software. You must set the configurator to ION USB configuration and then fire up the Granity software. And that's the point that I actually ran into my first problem. At first, it wasn't recognizing the wheel. It wasn't switching into the granity mode, which is how it does firmware changes and makes other changes to the motor. But through enough trial and error, turning things on and off, I finally did get the wheel to acknowledge, got the granity upgrade done, got all my settings and configuration set, and I was ready to head out and track. From the moment that I took this thing out of the box, to the point that I was up and running ready to race took me two and a half to three hours of time. Some of that was adapting my rig, some of that was just figuring out where to put the box, but a good portion of it was also trying to figure out and get the software set up. But once I did, I was ready to go, and now it's time to get on track. Before I even get to it, I've said it a few times and I have to come back. When you fire your first sim up, 
I would turn your force feedback down or you're gonna be hitting that emergency stop. This motor, again, is the strongest motor that I have ever put my hands on it. And if you didn't figure that out, just if you bought one of these and you haven't figured out by the time you've lifted it, mounted it to your rig, put these monster cables on it, if you didn't get an idea of the kind of power that you were gonna be dealing with, then I don't know what's gonna give you that kind of idea. Maybe that yellow motor we showed on the show earlier today. But I might turn my force feedback down very low and work my way up is my first suggestion with this wheel because it is super strong. Now I've said all that like that's a bad thing. I've said all that like it's a warning, like, oh, be aware, this thing will tear your arms off. And sure, it probably could. Again, it's made for conveyor belts and printing presses, but you want that power. There are reasons for that power. And we're gonna talk about that a lot more through this portion of the show. How does it drive? So my mistake was I didn't turn it down. And one of the first things I found out is this R, this wheel will hurt you. I'm out by death. You will need to turn it down and get it to the point that you want it to be just right. Now, when you get it dialed in, when you get this to that sensation, and it will take time, you're gonna need to make some adjustments. When you're dealing with a lightweight wheel, let's just call them the over-the-shelf, off-the-shelf wheels, Logitech, Thrustmaster, and Fanatic. Those wheels are great force feedback, but they lack the power that really is gonna hit you upside of your head. Now the difference is that extra power can give you the realism of a real car. And that's what we're going for with the direct drive wheel. There are other advantages as well. There's very little cogging, very little extra feeling in that wheel. This wheel is even smoother than my Bodner wheel in that respect. It is also extremely rigid. All those other wheels that we've talked about, somewhere within them, there's some flex. Something in it just reminds you that it's just an off the counter, over the shelf, whatever you want to call it, wheel. Versus this being so industrial strength, has so much rigidity that it feels, again, like you've gotten in a real race car and you're holding on to a real steering wheel. Now, again, getting it dialed in is critical. Those lightweight wheels that their forces, it doesn't really matter. 50%, 70%, whatever your force feedback of choice is, it doesn't matter until you get to the point of clipping, to the point it's exceeding the force feedback ability of those wheels. With this wheel, you have that so much power that it becomes critical to get it dialed in to the point that you want it to be. Now, if you're a real racer and you're training for your race on Sunday, you're gonna wanna duplicate that strength that you want or expect or get out of your go-kart or your open wheeler or whatever car you do drive. As a sim racer, we might want that realism, but what we're really looking for is the amount of force feedback that gets us the best effects to get us the best, best laps. That's the bottom line. The best lap times is what we're going for. So after taking days, it wasn't hours, it was days to get it to where I had all of my settings just right. But when I did, this wheel did something phenomenal. It gives you the ability to get so much power when that wheel loads up and you're turning in, you're feeling every bump in the road, you're feeling every bit of release and catching of the tires. So as the tires are working their way through the corner, the force feedback is just delivering. And again, the difference between lightweight and heavy force feedback is just how much you feel those finest moments. Sure, those moments are being delivered in any every steering wheel you're gonna get, but you multiply it by 10 and there's no ignoring those effects. So the wheel was smooth, it was accurate, and it was constantly giving me feedback. And again, getting it dialed in is really critical. You get it to the point where it's jumping the wheel out of your hands and that's not an advantage. Now, no matter how much I turned this up, I never got to the point of clipping in any of the games I tested. It essentially delivered more power than I could handle. I don't think of myself as a superhero strong guy, but I'm not a lightweight either. So the wheel delivered enough power for me to even get the sensations that I'm accustomed to in the cars that I've driven in real life. That being like an open wheeled two liter car, 
open-wheeled rotary Mazda or a go-kart. It definitely gave me that kind of power to the point where you are sweating if that's what you're looking for. Now again, looking for lap times, it's about dialing it down, getting it to that point where it's delivering me every effect that I want, but not to the point of distraction or the point of slowing me down whatsoever. Other effects, little things. When you start hitting the brakes and you get that lock up, you feel it that much quicker, you feel it that much stronger, and you're that much faster to react to the moment based on what the wheel is doing to you. And the one thing I've learned from using direct drive over the years is that I do want a little more force feedback than the lower wheels can actually deliver. So, 30 Newton meters is where we're at on this. Comparing this to maybe 20 Newton meters, 15 Newton meters, how much is too much? Now, I don't know if you can ever have too much because you're always turning it down and you always have that much to draw upon. I don't necessarily think you need 30, but again, some people, I know drivers who drive with a lot stronger force feedback than I do, and there might be a scenario where they're actually gonna want the power. The other thing that I consider, especially on the OSW version, maybe more than on a Bodner wheel, the price difference between the lower and the extra power is nominal. You're talking $1,500 US for this wheel, that's half the price of a Bodner. The difference between this and the lower, you've already made that step up. You might as well get the extra horsepower and always have it there to draw from. Now I mentioned the amount of accuracy this wheel has. Accuracy to me equals consistency. When you get used to this wheel and you use a wheel, and I don't wanna specifically say this wheel, I think at the point that you get to a direct drive wheel, you're usually getting encoders that are at such a high rate, and even some of the lower wheels have encoders at really amazing rates. But when you remove all the flex, you get it that rigid, that one-to-one, -one, and that force feedback that is always there. The consistency that this wheel delivers actually will make you a better sim racer. 10 years ago, I would have said, not a chance, it doesn't matter. Five years ago, I would have said, not a chance, it doesn't matter. But we're getting to that point where even the Martin Cronkies of the world have stepped up to a direct drive wheel, and it's a combination of two things, sourcing the right motors and getting the right software that can make it run the way we want, because we're not conveyor belts, we're not printing presses. We are SimRacer looking for real life experience out of our steering wheel. So again, what I found with this wheel was that I was amazingly consistent when comparing it to an average wheel. Do you need it to win a championship? No, and in fact, if I was an eSport challenger, if I was a guy who was really determined to go win one of these eSport competitions, I would probably stay away from the steering wheel. I'm not gonna say that you wouldn't enjoy it. I'm not gonna say that it's not great. What I'm gonna say is it's gonna take you away from the norm when it comes to those eSport competitions, because let's face it, when you get there, it's gonna be a Logitech, a Thrustmaster, or a Fanatic wheel, not an OSW or any of the other direct drive wheels out there. So the consistency is very important to me. The ability to hit my marks, and when I do make the slightest of mistake, getting that exact feedback of how much. When you're turning in and you hit a bump and it gives you that kickback, it's just telling you that much more of how much you need to lighten up the wheel because the force feedback is right there and it's so strong even on a lower amount. Why is it strong on a lower amount? Because it has endless amounts of power to draw from. You're never out of power. And that's one of the critical things of having such a heavy duty wheel. Now, I have a few times also said that that power can come to the point of distraction. And I actually think there is a fine line for most sim racers versus real life racers who sim race for training versus sim racers who are looking for pure outright speed. When looking for pure outright speed, I have to confess, I turn this all the way down to maybe 15% in say Assetto Corsa. And that's gonna get me my best 
lap times versus I might be able to run it at 25, 30%, but it's actually gonna slow me down. But the great thing about it is whether you're running it at 15 or at 30%, it doesn't matter. You have endless reserves to call upon. So if you have a moment, whether it's a wall hit, a wreck, or a bump, we were at uh, racing last night when there are huge curbs and I was feeling them kick the wheel and those giant spikes, there was always enough. But at the same time, because it was so fast, because it was so responsive, it was still giving me everything down to the finest details like road noise and the small vibrations or the small slipping of wheel angle because I was losing traction. The other thing that I have to say about this wheel, even when you turn the force feedback lower, you're still tending to run at a higher level than those lower wheels because when I run an iRacing on a Thrustmaster, Logitech, or Fanatic, for the most part, I am hitting the clipping point at some point in my driving day. I run enough force feedback that I'm actually hitting that clipping point where I'm maxed out on how much the wheel can deliver. That doesn't happen with this wheel. Because of that, because of the ability to turn it up, I actually would say that the power of this wheel actually takes you to a whole nother level of immersion. Now, it might slow you down when you get to the point where that wheel is moving you around as much as you're moving it around, but it is drawing you further and further into the wheel. Now, after endless amounts of testing, I've run one hour races, I've done four hour practice sessions, I've done Wreckfest, which will just tear a wheel up with the amount of crashing, banging, and vibration from the dirt and from the hits from the drivers and car damage. No matter what, the wheel was cool to the touch never smelled anything from the wheel whatsoever. It was a pleasure. Lap after lap, every single lap, it worked. So just to give you an idea of exactly how strong this motor is, I did some clips of me testing various different levels of force feedback until it got to the point that I just couldn't take anymore. So we're gonna do a little iRacing force feedback test. I have the motor at 25 amps and I'm gonna start out at 1%, and I'm just gonna do a little swerving, hit some bumps, and see how it feels, and then we're gonna step it up each time. So 1% right now. So at 1% right there, it's a pretty light wheel. I have a little bit of center resistance. Now let's speed it up a little bit and get some force feedback commands coming. Feeling just a little hint, but it's still not very alive at this point. Oh, okay, 2.8, 2.8% force feedback. Ooh, a lot more resistance. So look at that right there. That was almost the difference between on and off. At 1%, it was on, but not doing much. Now I actually have the wheel fighting me, and I can feel it. This is already to like Logitech strength right here, for sure. Hit some curves, oh, oh. Feel the kick of the wheel it's definitely on and this is already into the range where i'm like okay well a lot of people are going to be happy with this amount of force feedback right there i'm going to go for about six percent six percent now it's a strong wheel six percent we have exceeded fanatic and any of the T-Model, Thrustmasters, TGT, TSPC, any of those. Look at the amount of kick I'm already getting. Look at how much energy it's already taking to steer into the corners. We're at 6% force feedback. And to be honest with you, depending on the car, depending on the race, I have probably already stronger than I really want for average sim racing. Now we're getting into emulating like real life power. Um, this is about the amount of strength it takes to drive my Datsun 240Z around town right here. Let's hit a bump and see what happens when the wheel just kind of takes over a little bit. We'll hit this bump and crash and see what happens. Oh, oh, see, we're not far from needing, ow, ow, we are not far from needing that yellow button, the, the red button, 6%, uh, 
I'm afraid the next level is just going to downright hurt, especially if we had a wreck of some sort. So we're going to go to 9%. 9%. Definitely, you got to lean into it just to turn. Now we're starting to torture the rig. You know, inferior rigs at this point are going to be just being flexed by the amount of torque we are generating in the steering wheel at this point. Oh! The bumps at Sebring are just brutal. Oh, geez. I'm already feeling my heat and temperature rising internally for myself, the amount of effort it's taking. See some brake lock up at 9%. Not so much, you felt it go flatline and kind of dead and kill. Oh, we're about half the bar on the clipping meter at iRacing. Little bump action, really pulling the wheel out of my hand. Oh, it hurts. I don't really want to wreck because honestly, I think it's going to hurt. I did a gentle wreck. You can see the kick. All right, let's be a little more daring than that. 9%. Do you see the, the amount of effort it's taking? All right. Oh, I'm so afraid, you guys. Ah. Yep, that hurt. I'm glad it stopped moving, right? Oh, oh. All right, do we dare try 12? I mean, like, I've heard people say things like the 100% force feedback challenge. You gotta be kidding me. If you wrecked the car, it would just, I don't know. I mean, these shifters would cut my hands, depending on how it got yanked out. 12%. Tremendous. Now we're like, I don't know if I could actually run at this strength, to be honest with you. This is an intense amount of effort to turn the wheel. There's no way. There's no way I could... Ah. And if you did something wrong, we're at 12%. We are at half of the clipping bar. Now, should there be an emergency, just to show you the way this wheel operates. I just cut the force feedback from the motor, but it still registers. So if you do have a problem with a wheel like this, and then as soon as I do that, it brings the power right back. All right, let's hit the wall. Twelve percent. Twelve percent. All right, I'm gonna do. 20%, just once real quick. Seriously. Yeah, this is just, okay, forget that. Okay, ah, that's the end, I can't do that. Oh. So again, after all of my extensive amount of driving, I gotta tell you, this wheel delivered in a good way in every single scenario. I never had a moment of driving where it wasn't doing something predictable or had some ill effect other than me having the force feedback just outright too strong to the point that I had to hit that emergency stop. But for the most part, that wasn't the case. It did work perfectly lap after lap, sim after sim. But I will say, this is a high-end wheel. It's a strong wheel. It's not intended for beginners. It's not intended for children. I would not let my kids near this wheel unless I had made absolutely certain that the wheel was turned down to the lowest force feedback possible. I'd make sure this was very much at the ready because it is an industrial strength motor. On top of that, this is not really intended for the amateur driver. It is a PC. It is a hardcore wheel. It's not going to work on your Xbox. It's not going to work on your PlayStation. Now, even though it is a wheelbase all in its own, it doesn't come with the wheel, you do have abilities. You can get a variety of different wheels to add to it. 
you can actually work with this and plug in your own DIY pedal set. It's got abilities and expansion, and that's one of the beauties of the OSW, the open source wheel. It is endless what you can do and what you will be able to do in the future with this wheel. It does make it fairly unique when comparing it to just about any other wheel out on the market, and I will say there are a lot of different OSWs to choose from. Now, if it hasn't been clear, my opinion, my overall thoughts about this wheel, let's go ahead and break it down with the good, the not so good, and then finish with the bottom line. Now, starting with the good, very strong wheel motor, smooth, zero friction, zero lash, zero cogging, silent, no noise at all, none whatsoever, other than what it makes rattle your wheel, your rim, your rig, everything in the house. Extremely accurate, extremely fast reading. No flex. Incredible delivery of force feedback with no loss or clipping. Makes every PC sim better. Immersion, a, a wheel of this power and this realism draws you further into the sim. Multiple profiles can be created. Adjustable degrees of rotation. Easy to mount, just four holes and it's bolted. Great looking wheel in an industrial sort of way. Bulletproof, built to last, well, forever. Mount is strong and has a good amount of angle adjustment. Built for professional simulators. State of the art. Confidence building. It adds to my ability to judge the car. Capable of real life forces. And now on to the not so good. A little tricky to get the software set up. Windows only sees my wheel on startup about 50% of the time. Constantly resetting center with each startup. Will require a seriously strong sim rig. Might need to mod your rig, not a standard bolt pattern. No wheel, no shifters, no pedals, no extras. Extra large control box that will have to be accommodated. Extra large, extra heavy duty wires to hide and route. Expensive compared to the off the shelf wheels. Might not work on simple games. Large motor may restrict monitor placement. PC only. And now onto the bottom line. This is a serious wheel. So I'm gonna get a little serious with you guys on this topic right now. Who is this wheel really intended for? If you're watching this video and you think three, five, six, seven hundred dollars is a lot for a steering wheel, I agree with you. And there are plenty of champions who win race after race on a standard wheel set that could easily be gotten for under six hundred dollars. Again, so who is this wheel marketed to? It's to the professional. It's the guy who really races in real life and is trying to get that same feeling at home, which can't be done on an under $600 wheel. Who's it for? It's for the professional sim racer, for the guy who's tired of replacing inadequate plastic gear that after maybe two, three years, which is a good run for three, four, five, or $600, but who is sick of having to replace wheels. This is the last steering wheel that you're ever going to need. If you bought a first gen wheel, if you're sitting on a Logitech G25, I know you want to throw it away if you haven't already and step up to a G29 if you missed the G27 phenom. In this case, you're not going to be waiting for the next upgrade. You're not going to be looking for a new steering wheel. Who's this wheel for? It's for the professional. When you go down to the dealership and you buy a Honda, that car is going to last you forever. You change the oil, you do a little bit of maintenance, it'll run trouble free for its entire life. However, you take that same car 
and you juice it up with some horsepower. You put in a new computer chip, a cold intake, a turbocharger, and an exhaust pipe. Well, you got a lot more performance, but you also stepped up into a professional car, a car that's gonna require constant maintenance. It's gonna be finicky. It's gonna take brain power and expertise to get the most out of it. You don't just bolt those parts on and have them work perfectly. It takes knowledge, wisdom, trial and error, and in the world of direct drive wheels, you're getting a little of all that as well. You've stepped up into that tuner world. You're gonna have a wheel that might not be recognized every time and you might need a checklist to go through your procedures to make sure everything's operating per perfectly. But you know what? In real life racing, that's what they do. They don't just turn on the car and head it on the track. They got a procedure that they go through to make sure they don't miss a single step. Who's this wheel for? This wheel's for a professional. When you buy a race car, if you're a race car mechanic, you know the term nut and bolt. Nut and bolt. Every time a race car comes off the track, the mechanics go to work nut and bolt. They check every nut, they check every bolt because a race car is going to rattle itself loose. Now there's nothing in this motor that is going to rattle loose whatsoever, but everything else sure will. My Fanatic wheels, they both rattled loose. I had to get my tools out, find out which nuts and bolts had come loose and tighten them all up. My rig was even loosening up. This thing creates some massive force, some massive vibration, and you're gonna have to treat it like a professional. You're gonna need to double, triple check things. You're gonna have to go through your checklists. Who's this wheel made for? the professional, the guy who is willing to pay whatever it takes to get exactly what he wants out of a steering wheel. But it does come at a cost. Now the last thing I'm going to finish with is the whole concept of bang for buck. Is it really worth it? It's $1,500. How can I sit here at my desk and tell you to take $1,500 and spend it on a sim racing wheel? Well, if you want the most out of your sim racing hobby, it does come at a price. If you just don't want to have to ever buy another wheel, talk about consistency, never have to buy another wheel, that is the ultimate in consistency. Bank for buck, it is expensive. It's double, triple the price of those wheels. But again, you're not going to replace it. Bang for the buck, well, you can compare it to a Bodner wheel. Those are three grand. This comes in at 1,500, that's half the price. Is a little software, a little setup, too much to ask for when a wheel is half the price and even more power than the Bodner? It's something you have to kind of think about. I'm not sure I could advise it to everybody. I have friends who are not computer techs. I have friends who just getting a sim installed or their wheel, a basic wheel set up and running is a challenge. For those people, I don't care how much they consider themselves a professional. Please stay away. This is confusing. Please don't earn, spend your hard earned money on something so outrageous that's gonna only cause you headaches. But if you're willing to take the time, if you're willing to really learn what it takes to get it dialed in, go through all the software, get it all installed, well, bang for the buck, you're gonna get the same results as you're gonna get out of a Bodner at half the money but it does take that extra knowledge, that extra wisdom, and that takes time. So that is gonna do it for today. Again, this was a first, a first real live review, and I hope you enjoyed it. This is The Sim Pit, I'm Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.